Once again, I'd like to welcome everyone to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. It's going to be on wild pigs and presented by Mark Tyson, Extension Associate with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. This month's webinar is made possible through funding provided by the San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Mark, with that, I'll pass the controls over to you. And you should be good to go. All right, Clint. Uh, thank you for that introduction. Um, so today we're going to be talking about wild pigs. And uh, a, a lot of this material uh, will correlate to Texas. Um, but on the other hand, there are some uh, generalities that can apply across the entire United States. So um, often doom and gloom is associated with, uh, with wild pig populations. Uh, but the good news is that current, the current techniques that we have available work well. Increasing populations are a result of inadequate harvest, uh, not necessarily inadequate techniques. So the harvest levels need to reach around 66% of the population to begin to hold it steady. With that in mind, landowners are banding together and forming cooperatives. These cooperatives reduce the expense of population reduction techniques and magnify the results. A unified effort across an entire area of land leaves no safe havens for the pigs and also maximizes the effectiveness of the results. So one of the keys to seeing reductions at a local level is sustained management efforts. Once the sounder is removed, the management effort is not over. At minimum, vigilant monitoring efforts are required to assess if a new group of pigs is moving into the area. So what, what's the big deal with, with wild pigs? Uh, they're, I'd like to start by saying they're an introduced exotic ungulate. So um, they're considered an invasive exotic. Their impacts are wide ranging and they touch almost every aspect of our lives in some way, whether that's directly or indirectly. Uh, some of the economic impacts associated with wild pigs are often hard to assess. Our estimates suggest that about 52 million in agricultural damages occur annually in Texas. Around 7 million is spent annually repairing damage or controlling pigs in Texas. And from an urban standpoint, each hog can contribute up to $200 or more in damage. So um, as you can see, these, these impacts are wide ranging. And one of the, the things as far as modeling projections, everybody always asks, where's the population going? I often hold my uh, hand and arm out flat and just begin to raise it and ask folks to tell me when to stop and it basically is exponential. So as, as that hand reaches about as high as I can lift it, that's where it seems to be we're going. Uh, modeling estimates suggest that Texas is looking to have around 5.3 million pigs by next year. And that's based on uh, estimated harvest rates. So the impacts to humans uh, are often um, hard to estimate because it's hard to place value on, on a lot of the things and kind of see the big picture as to how that impact may lead to further impacts down the road. Uh, especially on the environmental side of things, it can get very hard to estimate uh, because environments are part of a complex process and one thing uh, can tend to throw many other things out of sync. So another aspect of this is competition with native wildlife species. Uh, we often try to figure out a way to, to represent this. So this was an idea that Dr. Jim Cathy came up with as far as what, how many native creatures are tied up in the biomass of a 200 pound wild pig. Uh, so it, it's pretty neat when you break it out uh, some of these numbers, uh, 582 northern bobwhites, uh, 119 fox squirrels, 80 mallards, 14 Rio Grande wild turkeys, 
uh, four javelinas, 610 doves. So if, if you look at it like that, uh, these numbers are quite shocking, but the, the negative impacts to these wildlife species are considerably larger considering the resources that are required to maintain and grow a pig of, of this size here at 200 pounds. So it's just another way to, to represent these impacts, and we're going to uh, talk a little bit more about that as we move into the presentation. So a lot of people often underestimate these pigs and um, and sometimes don't really realize intelligence levels. So I'd like for everyone just to take 20 or 30 seconds and just mentally rank these species in your mind as far as intelligence, one through six. So I'm just going to give a short pause here, I, I just mentally rank them, and then I'll go through the numbers. So these rankings are according to list25.com. Uh, depending on where you go, you're going to see a little variation in these numbers, but it, it generally holds true to form. So the chimpanzees are going to rank out at number one. The pigs actually ranked out at number two. The bottlenose dolphins at number three. Uh, just to kind of give you an example with these bottlenose dolphins, uh, when I was in the Navy, they were training these dolphins to do uh, underwater warfare missions, uh, like attaching mines and things like that. So the intelligence level is pretty high to be able to do something like that, and to have pigs rank on that scale, uh, that's pretty significant. So the, the macaws are going to come in in, in four the orcas in five, and our uh, beloved dogs in six. So this hopefully will paint a little bit broader of a picture as far as intelligence levels with these wild pigs. And when population reduction efforts are, are planned and implemented, uh, this type of thing can be something that plays really well into the planning section. So what I'd like to move into now is something I call behavioral drivers. So these behavioral drivers are typically generalities. Uh, these are kind of the net result of what you can expect if everything is normal and all things are functioning. Uh, however, these can become highly complex based on many external factors. So as we're moving through these today, just think about how you can take these points and relate them back to your, your management efforts. And um, I'm going to try and go at these points from both a urban-suburban and also a rangeland perspective, if there's any kind of variation that I've noticed. So with these behavioral drivers, these are the, the factors that I feel that regulate a good bit of the pig's behavior. And I'd like to share with you how you can, can incorporate these into your planning process to evaluate the, how you want to work at reducing populations. So thermal regulation, in my opinion, is one of the primary behaviors that generally controls how and what these pigs do. Food consumption uh, ranks second, also very important. And in third, I have social organization habitat components, and human influence. Now, I'm sure that you can go and probably list multiple others, but when you sum them all up and you look at them, they all come back to these type of, of scenarios. So I want to kind of walk through each one now with you. So thermal regulation is the uh, act of maintaining their body temperature. So these wild pigs um, have a unique characteristic in that they have no sweat glands. So they're not able to sweat like humans would or pant like dogs would or so forth and so on. So the way they have to regulate their body temperature is through their behaviors. So I have on the graph here the average high temperatures for Houston, Texas across the year. So as you can see, the temperatures increase till about August and begin to fall there in September and work their way down. 
So in general, behaviors as far as movements and activity is going to be more nocturnal in the months of May through September as that correlates with higher temperatures across the year. Those behaviors can become more crepuscular, which is active in the early morning and late evening, and, and also nocturnal during the months of October through April, during those cooler months. And one study suggested that distance from water uh, basically increases as the temperatures decrease. So as it gets hot on the landscape, the, as the air temperature rises, those pigs are going to draw in and draw closer to water. And we're going to talk more about that as we go forward. But as those temperatures go down, the pigs have a little more flexibility. They're able to uh, maintain that body temperature and, and not have to worry about that so much. So that frees them up to, to participate in other activities. So from a an urban or a rangeland situation, this thermal regulation is, is going to be about the same. The one difference is uh, in the urban situations, the habitat for this type of behavior is going to be a little more condensed and predictable. So in an urban situation, this may be something that you can pull up a, uh, a map that gives you kind of a satellite image and, and kind of look at the landscape and look for those areas of, of habitat and dense vegetation associated with water. And those same factors can come into play in a rangeland situation, but often there's going to be a lot more real estate in those rangeland situations. So it may get a, a little more difficult to determine those locations. So food consumption. This is a big one because these pigs have a constant need to feed. Uh, they have a very simple stomach. Um, Dr. Billy Higginbotham says that these pigs will eat anything that contains a calorie. And, and depending on availability, that's definitely the case. They're considered opportunistic omnivores, which basically means whether it's plant material, animal material, whatever it may be, that is available to them as part of their diet. So research suggests that vegetation is a primary diet item for these pigs. Depending on the studies that you look at, vegetation consists between 80 to 95 percent of their diets. So a big part of that is if, if, you're, if you're focusing on vegetation, and you're processing food very quickly, you're going to need to eat more often. And instead of just randomly hoping that you'll find those nutrient-dense resources, you're actually going to seek those out. So when these wild pigs move across the landscape and they, they go about rooting or, or foraging in other ways, they are not randomly just hoping to, to hit the gold mine, per se, they're selecting areas that contain these nutrient-dense resources. So it's kind of the, the mindset of the more calories you can get with the least amount of effort, the better. So when these pigs are damaging an area, it's important to remember that this isn't a random occurrence. It's a highly specific, almost planned activity as far as for that time of year. Often people notice that they'll have pigs on a seasonal basis on their property. And that comes back to several things, but one thing you can relate that to is the availability of those nutrient-dense resources. So basically, these resources come in and out of abundance based on the season. And a, a benefit to this is the greater availability during that season means that they're easier to find. So one good example of that would be uh, acorn mast. So when the acorns come in, the pigs are going to key into that, and they're going to begin to feed on those based on the access that they have to those resources. One advantage that these uh, pigs have over some of our native species like deer is the fact that they can not only feed by sight, but they also feed by smell. So 
as far as the senses rank out on these pigs, their smell is their greatest sense. Uh, it's their strongest sense. That's how they're able to to sense these resources that are underground and root for them and, and find them and be very successful in doing that. Uh, with your common white-tailed deer, they're going to be more of a sight feeder. So these pigs have the opportunity uh, in this example of acorns to compete very well with the deer because they can not only catch those acorns that are visible, they can also smell those acorns that may be under the leaf litter and access those as well. So social organization also plays uh, a part in these behaviors. So typically you're going to see one of two things. You're going to see a group of pigs, which is called a sounder. So these sounders are matrilineal, which means that it's female-based kinship. So some research studies have suggested that there tends to be a dominant sow or maybe a, a lead individual in these sounders that kind of serves as the sentinel, uh, the wise counselor, the advisor, and this this pig kind of leads everybody and makes sure that everybody's okay and directs them to the food resources and steers them clear of danger. Um, and there's it's there's relation between these sounders often, but that's not always the case. Uh, particularly, it could be that mature female and then subsequent uh, females from prior litters and even potentially their, their offspring as well. One thing you'll notice is you will see boars in with these sounders. So typically that occurs on two scenarios. Uh, these boars are more juvenile boars or that there's potentially a sow in heat within that sounder so that boar is going to join up with them. Uh, more typically with, with bigger boars, you'll see them as a solitary individual. And, and that plays into breeding opportunities. And they'll also uh, readily compete with other males and in some instances um, members of sounders for those food resources because they have such a large body size that it takes more calories to, to keep them going. And on that same note, there was one study that took place in eastern Texas that uh, estimated the home range of the females to be somewhere around 1,600 acres. And compared to the males on that same study area, their home range was over 3,000 acres. So those males that were the, the solitary males were covering a lot more real estate in search of those breeding opportunities. And um, so that kind of explains how you'll see them break out. But again, depending on situations, that might not necessarily always be the case. Uh, and also, when you're looking at these different interspecific interactions, that can play into kind of how you want to decide which technique may work best for you. So be thinking of that um, as you go forward into your planning. So habitat po components play a big part of where these wild pigs uh, move throughout and select. So given the option, given the choice, typically these wild pigs will select riparian or wetland habitats, and, and that's for a variety of reasons. So the word riparian refers to an area of land that separates a water body like a creek or a river or a stream from a more upland area. So if you were looking at a, a river from above, that dense canopy of vegetation, that dense uh, patch of trees and, and other plants along that river, that's going to be the riparian area. And as that dense stand of, of timber phase out into more open country, that's going to be your upland area. So these riparian areas are, in, in a way, a transitional habitat. And riparian areas are also very important to water quality uh, because they have a, a broad diversity of trees that help to filter water as it moves from the upland down into the water body and other things. So these areas serve an important function in, in water quality terms as well. So these pigs like to select this type of habitat for several reasons. 
And there's going to be cooler temperatures. I'm sure we've all had the experience of walking down into a creek bottom in the shade, and you can almost immediately notice that, that temperature change, that somewhat cooler air there. There's also going to be a diversity of plants, and as we discussed just a little earlier in uh, food consumption, they, they like to select that vegetation. So these type of habitats are going to have a, a broad diversity of plant species. They're also going to be close to water. Uh, and with that becomes that dense cover. And also one thing that plays out real nicely with these riparian areas is that they can serve as travel corridors. So I often ask people if they've ever seen a wild pig highway. And, and some folks will acknowledge and some folks will look a little confused. And, and I tell them, if, if you've ever seen a river, you've seen a feral hog highway, and then they often chuckle, and then I say, if, if you've ever seen a creek or a stream, you've seen a farm-to-market road. So if you look at the way that rivers are laid out across the state of Texas, in general, they are pretty well spaced out, and they run from the northwestern portion of Texas towards the, the southeastern portion of Texas. And you tie in those creeks and streams and, and bayous and tributaries into that, and you've got a pretty extensive road system for these, for these wild pigs. So these areas definitely serve as travel corridors as well. They're typically lower than the surrounding uplands, and they also offer a relatively um, gentle gradient, uh, so they kind of, it's not a bunch of hills and dips and valleys. It's a pretty level gradient per se. And it's just a, a great resource for these pigs to utilize. So they derive many benefits from these habitats. So we've, we've taken some time to stress the importance of these riparian habitats, but we can also know from just other reports that these pigs can make a, a living in a very diverse array of habitats. Um, more recently, I've seen news of pigs making a living in Saskatchewan the province in Canada. So know that although they do have preferences, they can uh, make a living in those harsher environments as well. With some modeling projections that have been looked at, it's suggested that 79% uh, of Texas is actually suitable habitat for these wild pigs. And a couple of parameters in there uh, basically accounted for the amount of rainfall is one of the primary factors in that assessment. But one thing that didn't really show up was those urban areas as suitable habitat. And uh, those folks that are listening in or joined in from, from these urban areas definitely know that these wild pigs can become a problem in those types of areas because if you think about it, the green belts and the, the different uh, preserves and things like that often contain this riparian habitat because it's subject to flooding um, and isn't necessarily suitable for development. So these type of habitats occur in both urban, suburban, and rangeland situations, and they are highly preferred by pigs. So this is where it gets tricky. This is where all the rules fly by the way. So human influence. Uh, can definitely change the behaviors of these uh, pigs and totally make everything I've just said null and void in some circumstances due to uh, a change in behavior. So one thing to note is if there's an opportunity on the landscape, especially for a food resource, uh, that can be a, a positive influence on the pigs but a negative influence on the producer. So in this photograph here, we have a, um, a protein free choice feeder. So it allows the deer to just come right in and uh, have their fill of protein feed. Well, on that same note, the wild pigs here have picked up on that opportunity and have uh, definitely utilized that resource. So that's one way that, that human influence can typically be a good thing for these wild pigs. Another one that we often see around Texas is those uh, 
spin cast feeders, so uh, wildlife feeders, deer feeders, those things are also going to make uh, a food resource, primarily corn, available to these wild pigs. So they will key into those type of human related items. On the opposite side of that, uh, when humans put pressure on these wild pigs, it can definitely change their behavior. So as, as pressure increases, typically the elusiveness of these pigs increases. Um, they're, they're very, very well able to assess where the dangers are and, and generally when those dangers are, are present. Uh, one scenario would be uh, using some night vision equipment and relying on the moonlight per se. So as that moon sets, potentially the night vision will be degraded. So those hogs can pick up on the fact that typically the pressure stops after the moon sets and they can make that shift in their travel pattern. So just examples like that can show how human influence can play a big part. So really the human factor is what can change all of these other behavioral drivers. So we're going to have a little poll here. I um, want everyone to guess the weight of the pig on the lower right. We're going to give you about a, about a minute or so to do that. So if you don't mind, uh, go ahead and cast your vote. And if you've already voted, just be thinking on that pig up on the upper left. Uh, be thinking of your potential estimate there. Uh, we'll allow a little less time for that question. All right, five seconds left. Go ahead and get your votes in, and then we'll close the voting briefly. All right, so we're going to close the poll on that lower right pig. So we should see the answers pop up here briefly. Uh, one thing to keep in mind with these photos, photos are often hard to evaluate as far as the angle, the distance, the height of the picture. Uh, but this is always a neat exercise just to give folks a perspective on body size with these pigs. All right, so we have 193 and, and 250 are the lower end, and most folks guessed 335. So. That's pretty neat because that pig is 335, so outstanding. So if we're going well, we're gonna to bring in the second question here, so we're going to be evaluating the pig on the upper left. We're going to give 30 seconds for this one. All right, so you've got about five seconds left here. Go ahead and get your votes in. All right, we're going to go ahead and close the voting on that one and wait for the results. All right, so the majority says 422. Um, on this pig, it's 365. So uh, again, the distance from the pig and the angle and different things play into it. But these are some big pigs. So most commonly, pigs aren't going to get this big unless they get in on a nutrient-dense resource, uh, such as uh, agricultural crop production 
or a feedlot or, or some situation like that where they're able to uh, access a high amount of food items in a relatively small area that are all nutrient rich. So this is just kind of a fun activity to uh, just show some potential out there. And these are both Texas pigs. So we're going to move into the research portion. So the first thing that we always hear about is these uh, continuous catch gates. Uh, they're called rooter gates, different things like that. Some folks out of uh, Auburn University did a little evaluation of continuous catch doors. So they constructed 26 corral traps on four study areas. They pre-baited each trap for just under a week to condition the pigs to freely enter the trap and be able to leave without having any negative impacts. They used game cameras to identify those individuals that were entering and exiting. And then on those traps, they randomly assigned a door type. So we're comparing the continuous catch door to a, um, another type of door that a saloon door. So the continuous catch door is the door that you see there on the screen. in the middle, so that's that black door there. The saloon door is the door you see closest to you, that's the green door. So both of those doors have the opportunity, once they're shut, for pigs to push in, so hence the continuous catch terminology. So in this study, uh, 222 wild pigs were observed outside of the closed traps. One thing that's important to note on this study is that they sat each trap to catch after that pre-baiting phase, and they were only trying to capture part of that group. So they intended to only catch a, a, a portion of the pigs that showed up at a specific time because they wanted to record the behavior of the non-captured individuals with game cameras. So they wanted to see, of the ones we didn't catch, are they going to try and go into these gates? So this study observed 222 pigs outside of the closed traps. Uh, they observed 178 entry attempts, which is classified as a door touch, uh, 11 entries, and uh, four individuals actually escaping from closed doors. So these researchers suggested that continuous catch doors were ineffective in capturing substantial numbers of additional pigs after the door had closed. Given the comparatively lower cost of simple wooden falling doors or guillotine type gates, landowners and wildlife managers should weigh the relative cost and benefits of continuous catch doors when developing wild pig removal programs. So that's, that's an evaluation that was just trying to see if, if we're going to choose a gate maybe which one will we have better results with? Or what results can we expect from this type of scenario? So we're going to move into a different study. This study looked at corral traps, which is the trap there on your left, and box traps. So they used game cameras to examine the patterns of trap entry uh, by wild pigs around each style of trap and then conducted a trapping session to compare trap success between the trap styles. So for the box trap that they used, that trap there on the right, it was a four foot trap that was four foot wide on the front, eight foot long, and three foot high. The corral trap, the trap on the left you see, was basically a corral made out of three 16 foot long panels that were five foot high. So not exactly what you're seeing in the pictures, but just giving you an idea. So one of the big differences between a corral trap and a box trap is the amount of real estate that the pigs have between the entry point and the trigger mechanism. So if you look there on the right, you'll see that there's basically only eight foot between the entrance and the very end of the trap. So actually that trigger mechanism is closer. So that plays into the opportunity to capture the, the pigs because the more distance they have to enter the trap without 
necessarily impacting the, the trigger mechanism, the better chance you have of capturing more individuals. So what did this study find? This study found that the capture rate for corral traps was greater than four times that of box traps. Um, it was really interesting to note some of the results. 71% um, of the hogs who visited the corral trap entered the trap. Uh, on the opposite to that, 37% of the hogs that visited the box trap entered that trap. Uh, they also took some efforts to estimate the cost per pig captured. On the corral trap, their estimate was $28.91, and on the box trap, their estimate was $142.12. Uh, a couple of other interesting points from this study is that adult females were twice as likely to enter or re-enter a corral trap compared to the box trap. And adult males had the least amount of trap entries, but they did enter a corral trap more often than they entered a box trap. For juveniles, they found both similar entry and re-entry among both trap styles. So that's just kind of some neat things that you can pull from that study. To that note, um, another study was conducted on the different types of uh, gate styles on a box trap. So in this study, it was uh, across six years, uh, took place in 17 different Texas counties with 31 different trapping campaigns. Um, so all trap configurations were identical with the exception of the gate style. So the two different gate styles they had was basically a side swing gate and a rooter gate. So what they found was that um, basically there was no difference in the capture rate between gate styles for adult adults in general, so that's adult males and females, but they found that juvenile capture rates and total capture rates did differ between the rooter gate and the side swing gate. The box traps with the rooter gates captured more juveniles, resulting in more total captures than box traps with the side swing gates. So they suggested for box traps that potentially rooter gates should be considered over side swing gates in management programs aimed in reducing overall damage. So one thing with the box traps that I had mentioned was the whole thing about the amount of real estate that the pigs have before they'll encounter that trigger mechanism. So there is some things to do because everybody has their favorite style of trap. There's, there's some folks out there that are strictly corral trap and some folks out there that are strictly box trap. So whatever trap that it is that you prefer, you can look for ways to, to modify that trap to increase your success. So with these box traps, if that's something that you're, you're really interested in, you can increase the size of these traps. So this is an example of, of a way that you can do that. So you can build a bigger box trap. So just wanted to put that one out there that that is an option for folks. So another technique is aerial gunning. So this study was conducted uh, in Texas where they wanted to uh, assess aerial gunning and the, and the effects of it on feral pig behavior and determine if this aerial gunning altered the home range or the core area or distance between the um, the movements of these pigs. So they found that the home range and the core area did not differ before or after the aerial gunning took place. Uh, however, they did find that the wild pigs moved at a greater rate during the aerial gunning phase uh, than they did before or after. Uh, one, one neat finding from this study was that um, feral swine often moved um, greater than 1.5 kilometers outside of the initial home range, but then they also returned to that home range by around 9.15 p.m. in the evening on the same night that that gunning was performed. So that just kind of shows uh, insight into a little bit of the behavior of pigs uh, in, re in respect to this type of control technique. So behavior around traps. This was a study also conducted um, out of Alabama. 
So with this one, they basically monitor the the behavior or the interactions that these pigs had with the traps. And there's some neat things that they found in, in this monitoring. Uh, that the solitary boars made fewer visits per trap night than sounders. And likewise, the visit duration for those boars was around 32 minutes versus 69 minutes for the sounder. Um, and here's a, here's a really neat one because there's often question on this topic. So of 131 pigs captured and released, 95, that's about 72.5%, were subsequently recaptured. Uh, you often hear a lot of folks say, you know, you catch a pig and, you know, then you educate them for the rest of their life. Well, in this study, they were actually able to recapture 72% of the pigs that they originally captured. Um, another thing that was interesting from this study is that they observed 12 instances where pigs were captured in traps in which other pigs had been previously euthanized. Um, so data from this study suggests that there's considerable, considerable variation to be expected in pig behavior around traps. Um, so that was just a, an interesting view into some of the things that are going on in the research world and uh, what results they're finding. And as time goes, research continues, so it's always good to keep an eye on, on what's going on and what's coming out in the future. So I wanted to share with you briefly a few novel techniques, um, you know, kind of some neat things to, to take away and, and maybe give a, give a look at uh, in your management efforts. So this first one is a tire trigger. So often folks have a problem with the, folk, with the pigs triggering a trap before they're ready. So typically when a sounder comes in on a, on a bait site or a trap site, there's, there's an age structure correlation with the pigs that interact with the food first. So typically you're going to see those juveniles rush in to the bait and go ahead and try and consume as much as they can before the older pigs come in and shoo them away. And in that rush, sometimes inadvertently that tripwire can be triggered and the trap ends up with juveniles on the inside and adults on the outside. So this is kind of a neat technique to, to bridge that gap. So in your pre-baiting phase, like you'll see there on the upper left of the screen, you're just going to have a tire. And you're going to want to make sure and fill that tire with, uh, with corn and, and have that corn in and around that tire. Because what that's going to do is that's going to teach the, the bigger pigs that there's, there's also food inside that tire. So if the little pigs come up on that, they won't really have too big of a uh, problem with tripping the wire because it's, the tire is too heavy for them to move. So it's going to take a bigger pig to move that tire to get that wire to trip. So as you can see in the, the lower left picture, the gentleman is uh, baiting around and inside that tire, and you can see that green line coming up from the tire uh, connecting to another line that's horizontal. So that kind of shows how this tire connects to the tripwire. And then if you look at the picture on your right, it's kind of hard to follow, but you see that same picture from a, from a wider perspective. So you see that tire with the, with the vertical line connected to the horizontal line, which goes right up to about the middle of that sheet of plywood uh, where it's attached to a, uh, what's called a breaker board, which is a hinged board that will collapse with a sufficient amount of pressure. So this is just a neat way to uh, change up your trigger system in your manually triggered traps. So I just wanted to share that as, as a technique uh, to utilize if you so choose. Another technique that uh, can be useful for you is guided exclusion. So in this instance, uh, you know, you've got this fence line where it's really hard to determine where the, the wild pigs are going to cross. Uh, and that makes it harder to, in, to enact some of these uh, population reduction techniques. So what you can actually do is guide these pigs where you want them to go. Uh, and you do that by 
placing barricades, as you can see here, uh, very creative use of materials on hand uh, to block those areas where the pigs are, are traveling and guide them to maybe another area where you would like them to travel. So this can be uh, useful in a lot of situations. Um, just use, use these kind of things as ways to direct those pigs where you want them to go and have them interact with your, your method of choice much easier than having to take a guess at it. So everybody likes to work while they sleep, uh, and this is the way to do it. So there's a wide variety of cameras on the market that have all kinds of neat features. Um, the features here I'd like to highlight are a couple things. So you have your standard camera uh, that's basically infrared triggered. They uh, can capture photographs and video and so forth. So those, that's going to be kind of your, your standard game camera that you're going to see uh, pretty much at any retail outlet. Um, so those cameras have the, the capability to work in the daytime and also work at night. And there, there are several models out there that offer the ability to take video uh, at night as well. So some neat tools to use to monitor your efforts, uh, to evaluate the response that, that pigs are having to your techniques and your scenarios, and just a great way to learn things that you probably never would have learned without them. Uh, another neat variety of camera is a camera that can take time-lapse photographs. So what this type of camera, similar to the one on the left, can do, uh, there's a lot of variety in, in models and, and manufacturers on this as well, is it takes a picture every between one and five seconds and capture those those images throughout the daytime and then it can condense those images into a short video file so that you can effectively view the activity in an area over the course of an entire day in just a few minutes. So you don't have that in uncertainty of is your camera in the right location to be triggered to take that picture. With these time-lapse cameras they're always going to be taking a picture. So that offers you a neat uh, tool to evaluate different things uh, as well. One drawback to these, these time-lapse cameras is they don't have any type of flash or lighting. So they're not going to work very well for you at night. Some other tools are out there to extend the lifetime or the, the service time of these type of of cameras. That's uh, solar panels and rechargeable batteries. So just be aware that there's a wide range of technology out there uh, as related to these trail cameras and, and to use those because those are going to give you insight into uh, a world of, of new opportunities. So we're going to take a quick poll here as far as uh, which methods are legal for reducing wild pig populations in Texas. So these are going to be the techniques that are available to land managers across the state. We're going to give about uh, 15 or 20 seconds to answer this. Okay, we're going to go ahead and, and wrap up the polling on this question. So. So while the, um, the summary is coming up, it's, uh, it's important to, um, to utilize uh, each technique that's available. Uh, there's, everyone's going to be a proponent maybe of one technique over the other, and there are techniques that are more effective than others. So uh, we had <laughs> a pretty equal amount on anything goes and both A and B. So um, Actually, there's going to be four legal methods in Texas. That's trapping, snaring, shooting, and the use of trained dogs. So those are the, the techniques that are available. Uh, it's important to note that any kind of poison or toxicant or anything of that matter is, is not legal to use. 
uh, and it often has broader implications than, than the pigs that are targeted. Um, so these are the options that are available to land managers in Texas. Uh, and there's a, a wide variety of resources available uh, on each of these options if that's something you're interested in learning more about. So often people want to know which technique works best. I'm going to tell you that trapping can be a highly effective technique, but ultimately you're going to have to apply a strategic combination of all of these legal methods based on the interactions that you're having with the pigs on your property. So Know these are available. Know that there's, that there's resources out there to help you understand how to utilize these techniques. And we'll talk more about those resources here in a, a minute or two. So let's tie this all together. Uh, so we've talked enough about wild pigs. Let's talk about fish and fishing for a little bit. So if you've ever fished at a place that you weren't necessarily that familiar with and uh, didn't really know how to read the local conditions and, and what, what the fish were liking for that time of year and so forth and so on, you may result in a capture uh, or a catch as you see there on the left. That's a, definitely a wall hanger. Uh, so you can apply that same type of terminology or, or thought process to feral hog uh, population reduction efforts. You know, you, you got to be able to, to know your homework, to, to know what to look for, to understand the habitat, to read how the pigs are using it. And, and you can use that information that we shared earlier in this presentation to kind of as a checklist to go through and evaluate things. So bringing this, this trophy fish down here back into the world of wild pigs, this is a scenario that can happen. So at this site, this is a, a pre-bedding phase, and the, the homework didn't necessarily go as, as it should have. So this area was selected uh, based on a few characteristics and a lot of assumptions. And over a period of a week, uh, the response was from one lone boar. So as we know, those boars are going to travel larger distances. So that can play into that, but in the end, it only resulted in, in one photo, uh, one pig visiting the site. So in the end, this, this effort was a net failure. So we're going to move over to the right. Uh, so in a situation where you're familiar with the habitat, familiar with the environment, familiar with the way that the, the species utilizes the resource, you can increase your success and increase your effectiveness, uh, as with these catfish. And the same way, you can do this with wild pigs. So this is within the same area of land after a little bit better assessment of the habitat and the, the signs that the pigs left behind and so forth. So at this point in this picture, these pigs are responding to the bait that's being provided and they're being conditioned to this site to be prepared for the efforts to, that, to come as far as population reduction. So to kind of tie it all together is use all of the resources available to you. Use those folks that are familiar with the landscape. Um, educate yourself on the pig behaviors, how they use the landscape, what types of things that are going to be driving their behaviors, and this can be your result. So a quick note on transporting wild pigs, that's often a common question. This is regulated by the Texas Animal Health Commission, and the Texas Animal Health Commission regulations apply only when live pigs are moved from the location of capture. Uh, so you want to make sure you're up to date on these laws and regulations. You can go online and search for the abbreviation T-A-H-C, and then you can put the word feral hog behind that, and that'll bring you to the website where they have information. They've even got a little pamphlet that clearly explains those regulations as they apply to moving these wild pigs. Uh, with that in mind, we've developed a website to assist uh, landowners and members of the public in reporting uh, these wild pig sightings. That's feralhogreports.tamu.edu. Gives you the opportunity to go on and report a sighting and allows us to assess it and um, kind of get some data, look at trends over time, 
and so forth. There really is no way to, to survey uh, these hogs, so this is kind of a, an attempt on looking at uh, observations across the state. So we have some additional resources available. Uh, our main website is feralhogs.tamu.edu. That's going to contain all of our publications, our videos, links to our social media. Um, that's kind of the place to stop for the information that we have available. Uh, for those that are more specifically interested in the uh, impacts on water quality by these wild pigs, there's this website here, and they have what's called the Lone Star Healthy Streams Feral Hog Manual. Uh, really great resource uh, for that. Uh, on our YouTube channel, we have currently 20 videos relating to feral hogs and wild pigs and their management. Uh, here you see a kind of an assortment of our top 10 videos as far as views. And a new series that we recently began is the Wild Pig Minute. So that's a, a series that is a short one to three minute video that covers some kind of aspect of feral hog biology or uh, behavior and so forth. So really neat resources for you there. Uh, for more of a nationwide perspective, on these wild pigs, there's the feral hog community of practice. That's at the website uh, listed. Uh, it contains 54 articles, an option for you to ask an expert. So if you've ever had a question you've just been dying to know uh, but don't want to ask, this gives you a way to anonymously ask a question and get a response from someone that's locally in your area. And this is available to folks across the United States. Uh, it also contains videos, frequently asked questions, and uh, four webinars similar to the one you're with today uh, by other individuals across the U.S. that uh, work in feral hogs and, and their management. So neat resource for you to get um, a nationwide perspective on the, the wild pigs here. Uh, if you're into social media, we have a couple of Facebook pages, the Feral Hog COP. And also our unit has the WFSC Extension Facebook page, so check those out. We have an online magazine, uh, it's Wild Wonderings. Uh, this is a really neat deal because it's kind of an informal uh, way for me to go out and, and, and share things as I, as I witness and observe things. So it's a really neat deal and it's not necessarily all wild pigs, it's uh, land management, um, all kinds of other things, quail management, lots of neat resources available on this website as well. Uh, we recently released a new app, uh, Feral Hog Management, so it takes everything you would find uh, throughout all of our other resources and condenses it into an app so that you can take it with you wherever you go. Um, so as far as from my end, how can we help you? Uh, we're available for educational presentations. Uh, we'd be happy to provide you with some educational resources and also uh, uh, work in collaboration with our county extension agents across the state to uh, conduct some site visits if you have uh, those type of needs. So with that, uh, everything we do is provided free of charge uh, through a grant that was uh, Clean Water Act non-point source grant from the Texas State Soil and Water Conservation Board and the U.S. EPA. Uh, with that, this is my contact information, and I know we're right at 1 o'clock. So if you'd like to stick around for questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Uh, otherwise, thank you very much for joining. Thanks, Mark. We do have a few questions that, were, that came up. Uh, for those of you all that are still tuned in, if you can't see the chat window, if it went away with the polling, Next to the word chat on the right-hand side of your screen, you should be able to click the uh, little triangle, and it should open the chat window back up for you. Uh, first question we had early was, will the PowerPoint be available for download? Um, yeah, if there's a way we can do it, I'd be happy to share it. Okay. Um, what we may be able to do is download it and put it as a resource on the TWA page. Uh, we'll work on that, and uh, I would say check back with either the TWA Facebook page or the AgriLife Facebook page, and we will get some information up on that. The next question is, uh, given that we're at such a severe and growing deficit, given the population growth and in inadequate harvest, 
isn't the only real option in eradication. Along those lines, thoughts about products like Hog Gone and Trials in Australia, and how soon or if they will be available in U.S. for practical use. Okay, so I, I believe the question relates to sodium nitrite. Um, with that, there's, there's extensive research efforts going on um, at various stages and levels. Uh, so those resources are being evaluated for use in the U.S. However, they are not legally available for use at this time. So that is something that is being looked at, but there's really no hard and fast answer on when they'll be available. Okay. Um, also, seeing more literature and speculation about deer fawn predation in drought stages by feral hogs, particularly boars. Do you have any comments or thoughts on this? Um, you know, uh, these feral hogs are opportunistic omnivores, and, you know, they will take advantage of a, of a food source if it's available. Uh, as far as evaluating the level or prevalence to which this occurs, that's going to be difficult. Um, I remember reading an article in reference to predation on um, goats or sheep, and uh, the author stated that often the evidence of the predation event is uh, very difficult to discover. So there's really a lot of unknown in, in that area that you mentioned. Okay. What's the latest thinking about the best approach to hog-proof uh, protein feeder stations, possibly the use of barbed wire or others? So on our website, feralhogs.tamu.edu, we have a link to a publication uh, excluding feral hogs from wildlife feeding stations. That's available uh, for free to download, and that'll address a how to exclude those hogs from the feeding stations. Okay, the next two questions kind of play together, so I'll just ask all of it. What diseases can these feral hogs carry? Which ones could possibly be transmitted to bovine? And are there any health risks associated with eating meat from feral hogs? Okay, as far as the question as it relates to bovine, um, Representatives from the Texas Animal Health Commission are experts in that area. Um, so ultimately, they would be the best source for that answer. I know there is some concern with um, different diseases showing up in bovine that aren't necessarily what they appear to be. Uh, so there are some concerns there, and I would suggest uh, visiting with your local Texas Animal Health Commission um, representative. As far as are there any concerns with eating um, feral hog meat, um, think of it this way, um, organic free-range pork. Um, so as long as it's cooked to a proper temperature, um, there's really no concern as far as um, consumption. But again, it just needs to be cooked to an effective temperature to uh, take care of all those um, things that could be on meat. Okay. What are the rules or laws of feral hogs in suburban areas to eliminate them, or what methods can be used to control them? All right. Um, as far as suburban areas, um, that's where it gets really tricky because when you call around to these different um, cities and towns, they each handle the situation differently. Uh, in one area, maybe the police department will deal with that kind of thing. In another area, the animal control folks may deal with it. And then in some areas, you know, no one deals with it. Um, so as far as techniques that are available to folks in those areas, they're, all the ones that are available are there, but ones such as dogs and snares and shooting really aren't going to be an option. So in those type of areas, trapping is probably going to be your best bet. Uh, with that, trapping can be highly difficult in these type of areas because you're often dealing with um, a very small property 
and maybe just a small lot, not even a half an acre, and you don't have access to the properties around you. Um, so one of the key things with uh, trapping is is being able to uh, have some flexibility in trap location, and that's not always the case in urban areas, so it can be very difficult. Okay, speaking of trapping, uh this gentleman says, I've heard that soaking corn in diesel fuel will prevent deer from eating corn set out as bait in hog traps. Do you have any comments on this or other ways to keep deer from entering the hog traps? Uh, I would suggest uh, not to do the diesel side of it because there can be some environmental impacts with that. Um, the same result can be uh, obtained through souring the corn. Uh, in some yeast, uh, just putting it in water and letting it get some yeast in there and sitting it out in the sun for a week or so. Uh, that'll produce that that same um, kind of deterrent. Uh, with that being said, if the food resources are slim and the deer want to access that, they will consume it. Um, so. Dealing with deer in baiting situations can be very difficult. Um, and also with your trapping efforts, you, you need to be aware of, of deer because deer can get captured in a box trap and, and that could be a, a big problem. Um, so there's a couple of, of techniques that I've seen as far as deer, um, but it doesn't necessarily correlate with consumption or deterrence from consumption, it more comes into play when the deer are triggering your your tripwire and impacting your trap. Uh, and that technique is um, placing a five gallon bucket on top of a few cinder blocks and attaching your wire to that bucket. Uh, so basically you're going to train the pigs to knock the bucket over to access the bait, but the deer will come in and most likely in most circumstances, eat out of that bucket and not affect that tripwire so that your trap will at least remain open to the pigs. Uh, now, as far as the consumption, that's something that really needs to be evaluated and maybe look at ways to deter that. Uh, one other thing quickly that comes to mind with that situation, if you have uh, deer or other non-target species uh, consuming your bait, get you a sheet of plywood and put it over the bait. So the pig's strongest sense is their sense of smell. So they're going to smell that bait under the plywood and they'll be able to move it where the deer and like raccoons and other things may not be as able to easily move that sheet of plywood. So maybe those are a couple things that could help you.